Thanks very much. It's a it's a real uh, real honor to to speak on this occasion of uh, Don's birthday. Uh, happy birthday, Don! Uh, I miss doing math with you, and I uh, hope to see you in person soon. It's been too long. Uh, but nice to see you in a little corner on Zoom. I thought I would talk today about a problem that goes back a long time, 85 years, to uh, Van der Warden. It's a problem I really like because it's very elementary, elementary to state, and yet the techniques that have gone uh, that have gone into it have been have been really varied, uh, ranging from sieve uh, sieve techniques to algebraic ideas of resolvents, uh, the determinant method. Uh, and what I hope to do today is to introduce this problem and then introduce a couple of new techniques uh, uh, that can be uh, into this area that can be used to attack, uh, attack this problem. So the problem concerns Galo groups of random integer polynomials. Uh, let me just state the problem for you again. I think many people are familiar with it. But So the, the question concerns taking random monic integer polynomials with small Galois group. So let E n of H denote the number of monic integer polynomials, uh, f of x of degree n, such that each coefficient is bounded by h in absolute value. So it's like a big box uh, of side h of monic integer polynomials. And we want to count the number of them uh, for which the Galois group of the polynomial is not Sn. So we expect 100% uh, of these polynomials to have Galois group Sn, that's Hilbert irreducibility, but can we make that quantitative? Uh, that's, the, that's the question. So what is, how many of these, so the number of such polynomials is about 2h plus one to the n, and we're asking how many of them uh, have Galois group not Sn. So there are clearly at least on the order of h to the n minus one such polynomials for which the Galois group is not Sn. The total is about on the order of h to the n, but we, but clearly there are at least h to the n minus one polynomials that don't have Galois group Sn, namely just set a n equals zero. So if this last coefficient is zero, then f of x is reducible and the other coefficients can be anything they want. Um, they're n minus one remaining coefficients, they can be anything they want. And that gives you a polynomial that doesn't have Galois group Sn. So they're at least on the order of h to the n minus one uh, such polynomials that don't have Galois group Sn in this big box of size h, size length h. And in 1936, uh, Van der Waarden uh, made this tantalizing and lasting conjecture that big O of h to the n minus one should in fact also be the correct upper bound for the count of such polynomials. That we've produced h to the n minus one of them and really that's sort of producing the right order of magnitude. Uh, no other Galois group will, uh, will occur more uh, than just these intransitive Galois groups that come from reducible polynomials. Uh, the conjecture uh, has been open for general degree, uh, but it has been proven for degrees n less than or equal to four. Uh, in Van der Warden's original work, uh, he gave a heuristic argument for why it should be true for n equals three, and this was made rigorous uh, by Chow and, and Dietmann, uh, not just for n equals three, but also for n equals four. So the conjecture is known up to degrees n equals four. So there's been a lot of work on this problem since 1936. There's no way I can uh, give the full history uh, of the literature, but uh, of course, Hilbert irreducibility, as I said, implies that uh, en of h is little uh, o of h to the n. So in other words, 100% of monic polynomials of degree n are going to be irreducible and have Galois group Sn. And the question is, can we make this quantitative? The ideal would be big O of h to the n minus one, but can we even do better than this exponent n here? And uh, Van der Warden himself gave the first such sort of power saving uh, bound uh, on, on en of h. So in 1936, Van der Warden showed that en of h is big O of h to the n minus uh, some function of n, but it's positive. <laughs> so it's a, it's a power saving. Uh, and successive improvements to Van der Warden's bound were then given over the years. Uh, since 1936, every, every few years, there was a, a new world record. So 1956, Nobluck proved that en of h is big O of h to the n minus one over 18 n times n factorial cubed. Uh, and then in 1973, uh, this was a real breakthrough. Uh, Gallagher introduced his large sieve 
uh, which has been so useful throughout number three, but he, one of his original um, motivations to introduce his large sieve was this problem. And 1973, he proved using his large sieve that en of h is at most big O of h to the n minus one half plus epsilon. So in other words, halfway there from n to n minus one, um, he achieved using his large sieve. And as is common in these problems, it always takes a lot of work to, I mean, this plus epsilon, you know, just getting up to n minus half plus epsilon and then removing the epsilon. Right? Sometimes the epsilon removal is very difficult. Uh, and this was done many years later by Zawina, uh, who refined this to en of h equals big O of h to the n minus one half without the epsilon. Uh, and that was using the larger sieve, so refinement of the large sieve. Uh, after these uses of, of sieve methods, uh, DeepMind introduced a new technique into the, into the subject. In 2010, he proved using algebraic resolvents uh, and the determinant method that En of H can be bounded by uh, big O of H to the N minus two plus square root of two. So if you think about it, that uh, this is a little bit less than N minus a half. <laughs> so that's, uh, that was an improvement in 2010 by different methods. And, and then just very recently, I think just this week, <laughs> Uh, uh, there's a paper of Anderson, Gaffney, Lumpy, Oliver, Lowry, Dota, Shekhan, and Zhang. Uh, just recently, uh, basically using a Selberg sieve, uh, they proved that en of h is at most big O of h to the n minus two thirds, approximately, plus a little bit. So almost two thirds of the way uh, to the conjectured answer from n to n minus one. Uh, so these are these are. These are the successive world records, but just this is, uh, I, was a, I was a fan of this problem watching from outside for a long time, and just seeing the different techniques that would get introduced in this and then used for other problems uh, made this a very uh, attractive problem to me. So this is something uh, uh, I started to think about as well. Uh, and so uh, what I wanna do today is uh, I hope to prove the following week uh, Van der Woerden conjecture. Uh, and by, by that, so that's what it's referred to. Weak van der Woerden just refers to that. Uh, it's the conjecture of van der Woerden uh, with, uh, with an epsilon attached. So uh, I hope to prove today that uh, en of h is uh, big O of h to the n minus one plus epsilon for any positive epsilon. So in other words, the exponent of van der Woerden's conjecture is, uh, is essentially correct. So uh, I haven't uh, talked about this before or shared the preprint with anyone yet. So. Uh, I am talking about this in front of a lot of people, I realize. So please, uh, please feel free to interject any time with questions or point out mistakes, because there could be some, but hopefully not. Uh, uh, so yeah, please, please uh, feel free to interrupt anytime. Okay, so that's the that's the goal for today. Uh, I want to try and give a full proof of uh, of this conjecture, uh, this weak conjecture with the epsilon, weak form of the conjecture with the epsilon, showing that the exponent n minus one is essentially correct. Uh, there's a more general question uh, that one can ask here, uh, which is if you take any permutation group G uh, in SN uh, on N letters, uh, then you can define N sub N of G comma H to be the number of monic integer polynomials with coefficients bounded by H and absolute value, such that the Galois group of F is exactly G. So it's the counting function for those polynomials that have Galois group G. And one can ask, well, what are the asymptotics of that? And how did that depend on G? Uh, so in particular, the above theorem, uh, this weak van der Woerden conjecture, amounts to proving that n sub n of gh is big O of n minus one uh, plus epsilon, big O of h to the n minus one plus epsilon for all permutation groups g uh, in Sn. But of course, one can ask the more general question, well, for certain groups, can one do even better than this? And the answer is yes. So I just want to point out that the methods that I'll be talking about today can in fact be used to give the best known bounds for n and gh for various individual groups g. Uh, but for today, I just want to concentrate on proving this theorem. So basically proving that NN of GH is uh, big O of H to the N minus one plus epsilon for all permutation groups G in SN. Okay, so the fact that N sub N of G comma H uh, is big O of H to the N minus one, the fact that that holds for intransitive groups, as I said, was already shown by van der Woerden, uh, using the fact that polynomials having intransitive Galois groups are exactly those that are reducible over Q. So for that, you just have to count the, the polynomials that factor over Q. Uh, and for that, van der Woerden had already shown that big O of H to the N minus one holds for reducible polynomials. 
And in fact, an asymptotic uh, of the form uh, Cn times h to the n minus one uh, plus a smaller order term for an explicit constant Cn uh, was obtained by Tela. So we know the exact uh, order of magnitude for intransitive groups, reducible polynomials. It really is h to the n minus one times a constant. Uh, and that constant does depend on n. Uh, meanwhile, there's another case that can be handled by using the fact uh, that there are subfields of, your, of the algebra cut out by f. So in the case that the, the permutation group is transitive, so the polynomial is irreducible, there's still uh, the possibility that the field cut out by f uh, has subfields. And so you can use those subfields to give an estimate uh, for, for how many such polynomials there are. So this is the case of imprimitive Galois groups G. So an imprimitive permutation group is one that fixes a non-trivial uh, partition of one through n. And so if G fixes a non-trivial uh, partition of one through n, then in terms of Galois theory, that means that uh, if, a Galois, if a polynomial has a Galois group that's imprimitive, that means that uh, Q bracket X modulo F of X uh, has a non-trivial subfield. And so Widmer has given excellent bounds on the number of such polynomials having imprimitive Galois groups using the fact that such polynomials have Galois groups that correspond to number fields having a non-trivial subfield. And the subfield could be uh, as small as degree two. And so specifically, Widmer gets uh, proved the result that if G in SN is transitive but imprimitive, then the total number of polynomials that have such an imprimitive Galois group, degree N with coefficients bounded by H is at most big O of H to the N over two plus two. So way better than the, than the, expect, you know, than, than the total uh, bound on the number of polynomials having Galois group not SN. So this is basically H to the N over two here as compared with the h to the n minus one that we wanted for, for all groups. So that's the case of imprimitive groups. So tran intransitive groups where the polynomials are reducible and imprimitive groups where there's a subfield, those are both handleable by, by thinking about those subfields. And so in, in order to prove the theorem that for all Galois groups, we have uh, h to the n minus one as uh, the order of magnitude, it suffices to prove the theorem nn of gh is O of h to the n minus one plus epsilon just for primitive permutation groups G. So these are these correspond to polynomials that cut out a field that doesn't have a subfield. Okay, so from now on we'll 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 restrict then to primitive permutation groups. These are the building blocks of all uh, finite groups. And suffice it to understand those building blocks for the theorem. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I may be misremembering the introduction slides, but I saw earlier that uh, this was known for n equals three and four. Yeah. Um, the the case of transitive but imprimitive is only lower than n minus one if n is six or larger. Uh, is there something for n equals five that I'm missing here? There are no transitive but imprimitive groups when n is five. Oh, okay. Well, then that's great. Yeah. So you can only have a transitive imprimitive group when n is composite. Okay, okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, primitive groups, as I said, they're the building groups of all permutations groups G, but then they, when you, once you restrict to primitive, you can exploit the fact that, uh, you can exploit the primitivity and primitivity implies various things. So for example, if you have a primitive group that's not SN and it has a transposition, well, that can't happen. So the proposition is if G is an SN is a primitive permutation group on N letters uh, and contains a transposition, uh, then it must actually be SN. And that's, that's why N equals five has, cannot have any, or when N is prime, you can't have any primitive transitive permutation groups because you'll have a, an N cycle and a transposition and that would mean it's all of SN. But in general, uh, suppose you have a group G and SN that's primitive and it contains a transposition. Uh, well, you can define an equivalence relation on all the elements from one through N that G is acting on by saying that I is equivalent to J if, if the transposition I, J is in the group, the transposition that interchanges I and J is in the group. And that's an equivalence relation uh, uh, on one through N that's preserved by the group. And so if that equivalence relation doesn't contain everything, then you'll have a non-trivial partition that's preserved by G contradiction since G is primitive. So once G is primitive and it has a transposition, then it must actually be SN. This is a, this is a standard uh, proposition your permutation groups. Uh, 
And so a consequence of this is that if you have a primitive uh, Galois group that's not SN, uh, well, the Galois group can, then cannot have uh, a transposition and therefore all ramification in the number field, it can't be simple ramification. So suppose F is an integer polynomial of degree N and you let KF be the field Q bracket X minus F of X. Uh, if the Galois group of F uh, is not SN and it's primitive, then it doesn't contain a transposition by the previous proposition and therefore the discriminant of discriminant K, uh, the discriminant of KF, the field cut out by KF must be square full. Square full meaning that every prime dividing it must occur to order at least two. Everyone see why that's true? Because, because the group cannot contain a transposition, you can't just have a simple ramification of a prime. There's always going to be extra ramification. And so the discriminant will be square full. So primitivity is sort of the building block of all, uh, of all groups. But on the other hand, once your Galois group is primitive, then the discriminant has to, has to be square full. All primes dividing it have to occur to order at least two. And so that's what we're going to try to exploit. The fact that if you have square full discriminant, then that shouldn't happen that often. Okay, so, so in other words, KF, if, the Gal if F has Galois group not equal to SN and it's primitive, then KF cannot have simple ramification. And so the discriminant has to be square full. Okay, so that's all we need to actually prove the theorem. So I'll jump into the proof of the theorem now. So, uh, so again, just to remind you, we want to prove that En of H is big O of H to the N minus one. And to do that, we're going to divide the set of all irreducible monic integer polynomials uh, with coefficients bounded in absolute value by H, such that the Galois group uh, is strictly less uh, smaller than SN and it's primitive. And we're going to divide these sets of polynomials that we want to show are at most H to the N minus one in number into three subsets. Okay, so they're going to be three subsets. So again, let KF be the field cut out by F. Uh, so the case one is going to be where the product C of the ramified primes in KF is at most H, but the discriminant is at least H squared. So the product of the ramified primes is less than H, but the discriminant is at least H squared. That's the first case. Second case is where the product C of the ramified primes is at most H, but the discriminant is less than or equal to H squared. Okay, so we're using this H squared as a cutoff point for the discriminant. And then finally, the last case is where the product C of the ramified primes in KF is greater than H. Okay, so remember H is the side length of the box. So, in the pro so there are two main cases where the product of the ramified primes is less than the side of the box and the pro where the product of the ramified primes is greater than the side of the box. And within that case where the product of the ramified primes is less than or equal to H, there are two cases, namely on whether the discriminant is bigger than H squared or less than or equal to H squared. So these are clearly three disjoint cases, and we're going to estimate them in turn. OK, so I hope those three cases are clear. And I'll write down what each case means on each slide so you remember. So, so we'll start with case one. And that's the case where the product of the ramified primes C is at most H, but the discriminant is at least H squared. Okay, so product of the ramified primes uh, is at most h, and the discriminant is at least h squared. So in this case, uh, so we're considering those f, was the product C of ramified primes is most h, the discriminant is more than h squared in absolute value. Uh, so given such a k, uh, the polynomial is f, such that kf is isomorphic to k, uh, must satisfy congruence conditions modulo c, because uh, C is the product of the ramified primes. Uh, and if there's a certain kind of ramification in KF at a prime dividing C, then that can be detected uh, in F modulo P by just looking at the factorization and seeing whether uh, that much ramification is occurring in the factorization of F. So given such a K, the polynomial is F uh, for which KF is isomorphic to K uh, will satisfy congruence conditions modulo C uh, that have density about one over D because D is the discriminant. That's how much ramification is occurring above C. And those conditions about being ramified that much so that the discriminant is D can be detected to C. Uh, 
so the density is about O of one over D. It's actually O of two to the omega D over D. That's one reason why this epsilon will pop up in the final, in the final estimate. The reason is that for every prime dividing D, the number of uh, polynomials that have square full discriminant at P is not one over P squared, it's actually two over P squared because there are two ways that the discriminant can become a multiple P squared or polynomial. Namely, you can have a, a triple root or you can have two double roots and each of them lead to one over P squared density. And if you multiply the two over P squared over all primes dividing C, you get two to the omega C times D, where omega C or omega D denotes the number of prime factors. Okay, so the point is that when we restrict to uh, the product of the ramified primes being less than H, uh, then, you can, then you can detect uh, uh, the discriminant just by congruence conditions modulo C and the size of C is less than the side of the box. And so you have this box and you have congruence conditions that are less than the size of the box. And so you can really get a good estimate in that case. So the number of such F can be counted directly within the box uh, because C is less than H. So the number of F with this description in D Right, corresponding to whatever the ramification is in K can be just detected modulo C. We can just count that you know, directly because congruence conditions you're imposing are less than the side of the box. And so we immediately have the estimate uh, big O of H to the N, uh, two to the omega D over D for the number of such F. So for each D, uh, where we're imposing some congruence conditions modulo C, C is the square free part of, of D, uh, and C is less than H, so we can so we get the estimate for each D that it's big O of H to the N divided by D, more or less, uh, for the number of such F for any given D. And then we just, uh, we just need to sum over uh, all such D. Uh, and that's where we use the fact that D is at least H squared. So summing the estimate big O of H to the N over D, which we got by just imposing congruence conditions module of the square free part of D, which by assumption was less than H. Uh, and so, Congruence conditions are smaller in size than in the box, and so we get this estimate, and now we just need to sum this over all square full D. Remember, we can assume D is always square full because we're in the primitive case. All square full D bigger than eight squared. So we just want to sum H to the N over D over all square full D bigger than eight squared. Uh, so you can think of this as being summing H to the N over X squared over all X bigger than H, and the X squared becomes an X, so you get H to the N divided by, by H. As the estimate. And this omega d, of course, causes an epsilon to appear. So, so this gives the desired estimate uh, big O of h to the n minus 1 plus epsilon in this case, because we did a summation of our estimate for each individual d over all d bigger than a squared that are square full, and that gives us the, the order of magnitude. So the point was that we restricted to congruence conditions that are less than the side of the box, so we get good estimates, and we restricted the discriminant being big, because then when we sum over all d bigger than that that are square full, it converges. And it converges uh, to, a, to an estimate that is good enough for all purposes. And so next we have to, to go to the case where c is less than or equal to h and d is less than h squared. Because if we did the sum with d less than h squared, then this exponent, when we summed, it would converge, but it would be bigger than the minus one. So we have to handle that case separately. So that we'll do on the next page where we replace this condition d greater than h squared by d less than equal to h squared. And for that, we have to apply a different technique. Okay, so here we're, uh, we're considering those f for which the product c of ramified primes is at most h and the absolute discriminant d of kf is at most h squared. Well, in this situation, the kfs that you can get, right? K equals kf is a number field of degree n having absolute discriminant at most h squared. That's the condition. There are not that many number fields having small discriminant. Uh, the number of such number fields k uh, by a result of Schmidt. So Schmidt has a general bound on how many number fields you have of degree n. Uh, namely, you know, if you're counting all number fields up to discriminant x, they're at most x to the n plus 2 over 4. The number fields having discriminant, absolute discriminant at most x. Uh, and since we're only We've now replaced this condition with d less than or equal to eight squared. There are not that many number fields uh, kf that can be cut out by such f. If d is less than or equal to eight squared. It can be at most eight squared to the n plus two over four. That's Schmidt's bound, which is at most you know, h to the n plus two over two. So that's that's the most that's the most number of kf that could possibly arise for uh, a polynomial f that has discriminant d less than or equal to eight squared. 
So this is not very many number fields. This is way less than n minus one, uh, h to the n minus one. So uh, as long as there are not too many polynomials that occur for each number field, uh, we'll be in good shape. And it's not too hard to see that there can't be that many uh, polynomials that occur for each number field. If you fix the number field, okay, how many polynomials can, uh, monic polynomials can there be, integer polynomials that cut out that field uh, where the coefficients are all bounded by h? Well, there can't be that many. If you just look at even the constant coefficient, we're saying that the norm of some algebraic integer in k has to be at most h in size. Uh, up to units, they're at most h to the one plus epsilon such numbers. This result has been made rigorous by a result of Lemke, Oliver, and Thorne. Uh, so they proved that for each number field k, uh, each number field k arises for at most uh, big O of h, basically polynomials uh, f. The big O uh, for h to the one plus epsilon polynomials f, and you actually get to divide by a little bit a small power of the discriminant here, so it's even better. So they're not that. So the point is, they're not that many number fields that arise, and the number fields that do arise, they can't give rise to too many such polynomials. So it's just we're just using the fact that the discriminant of the number field is so small that there can't be many number fields, and each number field can give rise to only a few polynomials. Are you, are you using somewhere that um, you've got the small product of ramified primes? No, we're not or just using, the discriminant. Yeah, we're not even using that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so the total number of f in this case uh, is at most uh, big O of h to the n plus two over two. That's the total number of number fields that can arise if the discriminant is at most a squared. And then after that, uh, Lumpkin, Oliver, and Thorne prove that each this number field arrives in at most h times log n, uh, log to the n minus one h ways. And so when you multiply these two things together, uh, well, you can see you're basically at h to the n over two plus a little bit. And so that's big O of h to the n minus one. Uh, when n is less greater than or equal to seven. I mean, when n plus two over two is still a little bit bigger than n over two. So until n is hits seven, this isn't uh, big O of h to the n minus one. But when you plug in n equals six, uh, you're just on the border. It's basically h to the n minus one plus epsilon. Uh, and if you just throw in this extra factor that Lemke, Oliver, and Thorne actually had as the denominator, then it also takes care of uh, n equals six. Uh, and then finally, what about n less than or equal to five? Well, if n is less than or equal to five, then we actually know exact results on the number of number fields of discriminant at most x. Uh, and if we use those instead of uh, the crude or Schmidt bound, uh, we again get big O of h to the n minus one and n less, less than or equal to five as well uh, in this case. Uh, and just to, just to note, uh, the Schmidt bound for large n has been improved uh, in some spectacular ways. Uh, first by Ellenberg and Venkatesh, uh, and then by Kuvenias, and most recently Lemke, Oliver, and Thorne. Uh, so this latest result says that we can actually, for the large n, we can actually replace this exponent n plus two over four by just log squared n. So for large n, all these, uh, these this estimate actually gets very good. But anyway, we just I have a quick question. Um, well, what happens if you replace like the h squared here with like h cubed? What happens to the estimates? Oh, um, well, I mean, so instead of, if we put h cubed here, we would have got, um, and then- Right, and for the case one? Oh, in case one, yes. Case one, would have, we would have done better. Yeah, so I didn't do, I didn't do use the optimal trade-off. You're absolutely right. h cubed would do better than h squared. Yeah. I see. But it doesn't work. And would that get rid of the epsilon? It does, yeah. It will get rid of the epsilon. So there's no epsilon for the case one and case two if you just choose, uh, the, the cutoff a squared to be a little bit larger. I chose a squared here uh, just to make sure that we handled these small n. But you're right, but once n gets a little bit big, we could have chosen a much better cutoff. And the epsilon would not be there. Good uh, question. Any other, any other questions on this case? So the reason this case was, was handleable was because we were now in the case where the discriminant is small of the number field, and not too many polynomials can arise per such number field. Okay, so, uh, so we're left then with case three, and that's the case where, where C is bigger than or equal to H. So the product of the ramified primes is bigger than the side of the box, so you can't just impose convergence conditions uh, there. Uh, okay, so, so that's the last case, a case where the product of the ramified primes in the case of F is bigger than H. So let's consider such F, uh, fix such an F, 
Uh, so what I want to observe in this case uh, is that for every prime P dividing uh, C, in other words, every prime that's ramified in KF, uh, the polynomial F has at least a triple root or at least a pair of double roots modulo P, right? because the group is primitive and square full discriminant. This is the only way you can have square full discriminant is that you at least have a triple root or at least a pair of double roots modulo P. Uh, and as I said before, that condition is detectable modulo P. Right? When you look modulo P, you can see whether it has you know, a triple root or a pair of double roots modulo P, it's a mod P condition. Uh, so the point is that if you change F by a multiple of P, it doesn't change the fact that P squared divides the discriminant, right? So in other words, just this, the discriminant of F is a multiple of P squared, but it's for mod P reasons. You can change F by any multiple of P and it still has discriminant of multiple of P squared. You know, usually when a polynomial is a multiple of P squared, it's for mod P squared reasons. If you change it by just a multiple of P, it won't necessarily still have value multiple of P squared. Uh, but in this case, it's the, uh, at this f, the discriminant function is becoming a multiple of p squared for mod p reasons, because it's this condition of having a triple root or a pair of double roots. Okay. Right? Uh, so, so here's a proposition. Uh, just this is a general proposition about integer polynomials that take values that are multiples of p squared. So if uh, h of x1 through xn is an integer polynomial, such that if you evaluate it at some integers, c1 through cn, and you get a multiple of p squared. And suppose, moreover, that when you change these ci by multiples of p, the value of h remains a multiple of p squared, no matter what multiple of p you change uh, the arguments by. So in other words, if h of c1 through cn is a multiple of p squared, for mod p reasons, you can change the arguments by multiples of p, and it doesn't change the fact that it's multiple of p squared. If that's true, then then the partial derivative of h with respect to any one of the variables, I'll pick the last one, xn, partial derivative of h with respect to any one of the variables evaluated at that same point will be a multiple of p. So if h is a multiple of p squared in this really strong way, then that forces any partial derivative to be a multiple of p. And so why is that? The proof is simple. We'll just, we'll just do the Taylor expansion around so we'll fix C1 through Cn minus one that we're plugging in. We'll keep the last variable and do the Taylor expansion about Xn, the last variable. And so H of C1 through Cn minus one comma Xn is equal to, well, so we're expanding around Cn, Xn equals Cn. So the constant term is H of C1 through Cn. And the next term is the partial with respect to the last variable of H evaluated at C1 through Cn times Xn minus Cn. And then the rest is a uh, multiple of xn minus cn squared. And now if you look at this, well, the first term is a multiple of p squared by hypothesis. And if you plug in, so if you plug in xn, any value of xn that's congruent mod p to cn, uh, well, this doesn't change, this is a multiple of p squared, but this is also a multiple of p squared if xn is congruent to cn mod p squared. And so if the hypothesis is that no matter when you plug in an xn that's congruent to cn mod p squared, gives you multiple of p squared, that means this always has to be multiple of p squared when you plug in xn at cn plus a multiple of p. Uh, but this is only guaranteed to be then a multiple of p, not a multiple of p squared. So that means this guy has to be multiple, always. So the partial uh, with respect to xn uh, evaluated at, at, at our point has to be multiple. So, so that's the proof. Uh, of that proposition. And we can apply this proposition to this discriminant situation that we have here. So here we have a discriminant, which is a, a function polynomial, integer polynomial in the coefficients of f. And they're taking, it's taking a value that's a multiple of p squared for, and it's, if you change it by a multiple of p, it's still gonna take that, uh, right, a, a, a value that's a multiple of p squared. So it satisfies uh, the hypotheses of this proposition and what that means is that if you take the derivative of the discriminant function with respect to any of the variables a1 through an uh, for such an f, uh, it will be a multiple. So let's do it with respect to the last variable. And what that's saying is that uh, the derivative of the discriminant of f with respect to say the constant coefficient an is going to be a multiple of c in this scenario where, 
where the Galois group is. It's primitive and not SN. Okay, hope that makes sense. So just this, uh, just this primitivity condition and the fact that the Galois group is not SN means that the that discriminant of F is a multiple of P squared for mod P reasons. And that implies that we have this auxiliary polynomial, namely the derivative of the discriminant that has to be a multiple of P. Okay, but the fact that this derivative of the discriminant is a multiple of P and the discriminant is a multiple of P, those two facts together imply that the resultant of the discriminant and its derivative is a multiple of P. But the resultant of a polynomial and its derivative is the discriminant. So if the derivative discriminant is a multiple of C and the discriminant is a multiple of C, that means that the discriminant of the discriminant is a multiple of P, right? Because the discriminant is just the resultant of, of a polynomial and its derivative. And so, uh, so the, here I mean, so what does this mean? So here we're taking the discriminant of F as a polynomial in A1 through AN, and we're viewing that discriminant as a polynomial in A1 through AN, and taking the discriminant of that polynomial as a polynomial in AN. So this is an iterated discriminant. First, we took the discriminant with respect to x for f of x, and then we took the discriminant again with respect to AN. Uh, and that has to be multiple of p for, for such f that have Galois groups that are primitive and not SN. So why, why did we do this? The purpose of producing this number that's going to be a multiple of c is that when you take the discriminant with respect to AN, AN is not there anymore. This is a polynomial in A1 through AN minus 1. So we've produced a polynomial just in A1 through AN minus 1 that has to be a multiple of C. It doesn't involve AN. So if F of X, which has coefficients A1 through AN, has Galois group uh, that's primitive and not SN, then, and if P ramifies in that extension, then P has to extra ramify. P squared has to divide discriminant for minus P reasons. And that implies that the discriminant of the discriminant is a multiple of p, which does not involve a n. So we found a, if this, so f, f satisfies these conditions, then there it, and p ramifies, then p actually has to divide a polynomial that only involves a1 through a n. And that gives us a way then to approach this problem. We only have to fix the values of a1 through a n minus one, evaluate the discriminant of the discriminant on those first n minus one variables, and that's some number, and the ramified primes have to divide that. And so C is determined by just the first n minus one variables. And once C is determined, then you can say that AN, uh, AN is determined. So let me, let me explain that. So, okay, so recall we're considering those F for which the product C of ramified primes and KF is greater than H and we're in a primitive non-SN Galois group. Uh, so for such F, uh, the polynomial DD of A1 through AN minus one, I'm calling it DD because it's the double discriminant or it's the discriminant of the discriminant. <laughs> of f of x uh, is a multiple of c. So if you have such a polynomial f, then the, just this polynomial in a1 through a minus 1 has to be a multiple of c, where c is the product of ramified primes and kf. Um, so we can just fix a1 through a minus 1 and evaluate dd on it and see what it is. And then c is determined as a, as a factor of dd. But that doesn't work if dd of a1 through a minus 1 is 0. Uh, but the number of a1 through an minus 1 in this box, such that dd, this polynomial uh, applied to it is 0, uh, is big O of h to the n minus 2. You can save a variable. In fact, using the large sieve, you can actually decrease this to n minus 2 to that, two and a half. And you can actually do better with some determinant method. But in any case, uh, you can always save one variable if you're on a variety in a box. Uh, the total number of points in the box is h n minus 1, but it's satisfying non-trivial polynomial conditions, so we save the variable. So the number of a1 through a n minus 1 is o of h to the n minus 2, and then a1 can be anything, uh, any of the h values, and so the number of f with such a1 through a n minus 1 is big O of h to the n minus 1. Okay, so this case where dd vanishes on a1 through a n minus 1 is taken care of. So we can assume that uh, we're only looking at a1 through a n minus 1 such that we plug it into dd and we get something non-zero. So let's fix a1 through an minus 1 such so that dd of a1 through an minus 1 is non-zero. Uh, then that means that once it's non-zero, we know that c has to be a factor of this. But number of factors of this is at most o of h to the epsilon. Uh, because all these, this is a fixed polynomial. And a1 through an minus 1 are all bounded by h. So uh, 
uh, number, so this is at most h to a power, so the number of factors is at most O of s, h to the epsilon. So uh, once you fix a1 through a minus one, this c is determined as a factor of dd of a1 through a minus one, and then, so the number of possibilities for c is at most O of h to the epsilon. And once c is determined by a1 through an minus one, then I claim you can just solve for an, the number of solutions for an modulo c to the discriminant of f being zero mod c, right? Discriminant of f uh, is a multiple of c and it's a polynomial in an. So you're just solving this polynomial equation, an, it's a one variable polynomial equation, an uh, for an, namely discriminant of f is zero mod c. And the number of such solutions to a polynomial equation uh, the fundamental theorem of algebra is at most the degree of discriminant of f in a n. Uh, but you have to do that modulo every prime dividing c, so that you have to multiply that over all, all the prime factors of c. So that's why you have this omega c factor there. That's another reason for the epsilon uh, But anyway, uh, it's just a constant. The degree is just a constant. Uh, in fact, the degree is n minus 1. Uh, raised to the number of factors of C. And again, that's a big O of H to the epsilon. Okay, so what happened here? We fixed A1 through AN minus one. We assumed that when you apply DD, you don't have zero. You don't get zero because that case was already handled. And if it's non-zero, then the C has to divide it. Uh, and that there are most O of H to the epsilon possibilities for C. And then once you have C, that determines AN by just solving the polynomial equation. So basically, Upshot is when you fix a, a1 through a minus one, you can actually determine a n up to a bounded number of possibilities. And that's why you get, you know, for even when c is bigger than h, that the number of, oh, I should also say, uh, we only, in this, in this paragraph here, we only determined a n modulo c, right? Because we're solving a polynomial equation modulo c. But since c is bigger than h, the side of the box, uh, you, if you determine an modulo c, you've actually determined an in that box, if it exists. You can't have multiple values of an in the box that are congruent uh, to the, what you want modulo c if c is bigger than h. So since c is bigger than h, the number of an in minus h comma h is also a big O of h to the epsilon. And so the total number of f in this case is again, big O of h to the n minus one plus epsilon. Uh, yeah, very good. So uh, yeah, so that, that basically proves, um, that proves all three cases. And so, so, we've proven, uh, so we've proven the theorem we wanted to, namely if the n of h is the number of monic integer polynomials of degree n with each ai most h and epsilon value, such that the Galois group is not Sn, uh, then the n of h is big O of h to the n minus one plus epsilon. So that confirms van der uh, new form of van der Waals conjecture. I have a little epsilon there, but that confirms that that exponent is, is correct. So, so thank you very much. That's what I wanted to prove today. Uh, happy birthday again, uh, Don. I'm happy to take some questions, but uh, otherwise uh, we should hear, hear stories about Don. Uh, and here's a, here's a drawing for Don uh, due to Kate. Thanks, Kate, for this. Uh, happy birthday again, and thanks so much for your attention. I have a very quick question, apart from thank you for this unbelievable talk and theorem. Uh, the question is simply at the very beginning, you said that one can't do better than O of H to the N minus one because you could just consider the reducible polynomials. Right. Right? But, right. but can't you just assume from it's irreducible right from the beginning and then ask the question then there's, so the lower bound in principle could be smaller for yeah, definitely. If you no, or am I confused? No, no, you're absolutely right. If you restrict to the irreducible polynomials, then we'd expect a much smaller order of magnitude for sure. So way smaller than n minus one is probably expected to be true. And if you assume that the Galois group is also not an, then actually one can do even a lot better. Uh, so I didn't, I mean, I, I knew I wouldn't have that much time in this talk. So, but there, there are a number of other directions uh, to go in. Uh, uh, one is that, first of all, I just want to mention that Van der Waerden originally conjectured the non-monic case and somehow 
authors went into the monic case over the years and that became Van Dorden's conjecture instead. But he actually considered the non-monic case and the techniques I described today work also for the non-monic case and it gives you the same savings, uh, you save an H. Uh, but to your question, Don, uh, yeah, the, these techniques actually do a lot better once you start making assumptions about irreducibility and not being certain Galois groups. So for example, if you assume that the polynomial is irreducible and the Galois group is not SN or AN, so I already made your assumption, I didn't even write it down because I knew we'd ask this. <laughs> uh, so if you assume the polynomial is irreducible and the Galois group is not SN or AN, and N is at least nine, then, uh, then these techniques actually yield an N minus two instead of an N minus one. Question. And if you assume that N is at least 16 with the same assumptions, uh, the Galois group is not SN or AN and it's irreducible, uh, then you actually get an N minus three uh, using these arguments. And more generally, for sufficiently large N, you can actually save an, uh, an unbounded amount. Uh, uh, so you can save a function that grows with N unboundedly. Is the idea here to use the other vanishing of the partial derivative? That's right. You, uh, if, uh, if P divides the discriminant to a much higher order, then it's not just the first partial that vanishes, but a number of partials will vanish and the second partials will vanish. And so you can, right, you can use that to, to get additional savings. So, uh, uh, so how many of the variables? I'm sorry? Can you, can you use those? The other, the other variables vanishing, the first partial derivative. Oh, uh, you can. You can use the other first partials too, but usually it doesn't give too much. It just cuts down the variety, but it doesn't cut down the co-dimension. Uh, but it helps actually to use the other partials as well. But it's the higher partials that really start cutting down the dimension of the variety. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So the, the, the group theory behind this is, is that if, uh, if, the, if, if you have a primitive group and it's not SN or AN, and it contains a three cycle, then it actually, then it can't contain it. So if, it, if you have a primitive group, permutation group that's not SN or AN, uh, then it can't contain the three cycle. <laughs> so some, and it can't contain a double transposition once N is at least nine. And so suddenly your ramification has to be even bigger than just a, uh, a triple root or a pair of double roots. It has to be even more than that. And so suddenly higher partials start to, start to come in and you can assume that those are also multiples of P so you can get additional savings. Great talk, Manjul, from your neighbor. Yeah, thank you. thanks, Peter. <laughs> yeah, Manuel. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, for this great uh, talk. I'm sorry that I had to be a little bit uh, passive because uh, the um, the uh, bar froze here, but our computer expert uh, helped. And um, yeah, the, so now we can start uh, after your great talk with your fantastic results. We can start with uh, the happenings for, for Don. And the first thing we wanted to do was to play birthday song, because of course, that's the first thing to do. And the birthday song is by Noam Elkis. 